Hey, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining the Jerusalem Press Club's webinar briefing. I'm Talia Deco, Vice President of JPC. Today, we will be discussing the Israeli economy, affected like the rest of the globe by the war in Ukraine, soaring global oil prices, as well as the pandemic, which hasn't left us just yet. Adding to these factors is Israel's unique population and of course the current wave of terror attacks and a potential political crisis. So where exactly are we heading economically and what are the main factors that might influence the Israeli market in the coming months? To expand more on this issue, JPC is happy to host Professor Karnit Flug, former governor of the Bank of Israel between 2013 and 2018, and today vice president of the Israel Democracy Institute. Professor Flug, who was the first female governor of the bank, also served as a deputy governor and a, board is, and is a board member of the Department of Economics from Columbia University, has an MA from Hebrew University as well. Uh, before joining the Israeli Central Bank, she worked for the Israeli Monetary Fund and was a senior researcher at the Inter-American Development Bank. Professor Flug will open this event with a brief survey of Israel's current situation before we open for questions. Uh, for those of you on our calls for the first time, I'll remind you that you're welcome to send us your questions in the Zoom chat box or WhatsApp or email or the usual means. Professor Flug, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thank you, and I'm happy to be with you. Unfortunately, it's still on Zoom, but uh, hopefully, uh, you know, the next time will be in person. Uh, so I'll share with you a short presentation just to sort of get us in and then take your questions. And let me start just with the general picture of gro uh, growth rate in Israel and in advanced economies and in emerging markets. And you see um, basically the, the uh, changes or the, how should I say, the decline, the sharp decline during the COVID and then the very strong recovery and especially of the Israeli economy, a very strong recovery and expected to continue that way. Looking at the labor market, also a remarkable uh, recovery. We've seen a, a sh shooting up uh, unemployment uh, at the beginning with the first closure, and basically since then a decline, and now unemployment rates are back to where they were before the pandemic, and employment rates are back to where they were uh, before the pandemic, so a very uh, sharp recovery, uh, sharper than anybody of us expected when we were uh, during uh, sort of the heights of the pandemic. Uh, wages have gone up. Uh, basically, there were some artifacts during the 2020 because people with uh, lowest wages were the ones that left the labor market. So we see we saw a sharp increase. But when we look at wages and corrected for the composition of workers, what we see, and this is the, uh, the green line, um, that wages are back to where they were on a trend uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, however, it's important to note that those who suffered mostly in terms of loss of employment during the pandemic were the ones with the lowest wages. So uh, in terms of employment, the, uh, the pandemic actually caused the widening of the gaps between uh, stronger workers, more, uh, more skilled, and those with lower wages and lower skills. In terms of recovering employment, almost all groups are almost where they were uh, in terms of employment prior to the pandemic. So what are the main challenges for the Israeli economy? Uh, basically, we're back to the challenges that the economy faced prior to the pandemic. Low productivity on average. We have one sector, the high-tech sector, with very high productivity, and the rest of the economy on average with low productivity. The low engagement in economic activity of ultra-Orthodox men and Arab women. It's not only that they have low employment, but also low wages because of low of inadequate skills. Uh, high inequality in wages due to the skill gaps high poverty rates among the ultra-Orthodox and Arabs due to uh, the low uh, labor income, 
And some of these, uh, some of these uh, challenges were exacerbated by what happened in the labor market in the pandemic. So just to get a sense of, uh, of these in, in numbers, you can see that GDP per hour worked, which is, uh, which is uh, productivity in Israel is growing more or less like in the OECD countries, less than in the US, and we're basically not closing the gap, which stands now at about 23% um, of the average in OECD countries. Uh, in terms of employment rates, uh, you, you see here the decline in the, um, uh, I should say the decline in employment of Arab men, the very low employment that's in uh, orange of, uh, uh, of Haredi men, which basically stabilized around 50%, uh, and the still very low employment rate of, uh, of Arab women, and the share of these two populations that are uh, less engaged in the labor market is expect, expected to grow and to reach uh, almost 50% by 2065. That's the demographics. Uh, gaps in education and skills are uh, huge. You can see that actually Israeli uh, Jewish is Hebrew speaking are more or less in terms of their PISA results, that's the results of the standardized tests of kids in uh, the age of 15. The results for the Hebrew speakers, which is in light blue, are very similar to the average of OECD. And the Arabic speakers are much, much lower. So this is just one indication of the huge gaps, which translate into gaps in wages uh, in the labor market. Uh, I mentioned the low productivity and the main, uh, I would say the main uh, causes for the very low productivity. And that's something that is not new. It has been with us for a very long time is the um, a regulatory burden, a bureaucratic burden, a inadequate infrastructure, which is here uh, reflected in the relatively low capital stock, which includes a uh, capital stock, a uh, public capital stock, which is mostly infrastructure and business sector capital stock, and the very low results in the PISA, which we've already seen, the low level of relevant human capital, uh, which is uh, uh, crucial for productivity. So these are the, uh, I would say, the main elements that explain the low productivity of the Israeli economy in the part which is not the the bright part of the economy, which is the high tech. Um, all of this is translated into high uh, rates of productivity. You can see the Haredi, uh, uh, sorry, low, high rates of poverty. You can see it, uh, for the Haredi uh, population, uh, the poverty rates are, uh, we're talking about relative poverty rates, okay, um, which are around uh, over 40%. They are next to it with, again, uh, around 40%. And uh, with the rest of the population, around uh, 20%. These are the latest numbers for 2020, um, uh, but they reflect, they reflect basically what we've seen for many, many years. What are the main uh, areas of strength of the economy? Sound macroeconomic situation, uh, sound financial system, both served us very well during the pandemic and sort of limited the damage, the longer term damage to the economy, helped it recover uh, strongly, and strong innovation-based high-tech sector. So just to get a sense, uh, we have a, we had prior to the pandemic declining public debt, which allowed the government to, uh, to deploy a very large package to support the economy and support people who lost their jobs 
during the pandemic. We had relatively high growth. We have current account surplus. We've had that for the over the last 20 years and a very strong and dynamic and tight labor market prior to the pandemic. Uh, the high tech sector, you all know, this is just the number of startups in the various areas, uh, including software, digital health, clean tech, cyber, and so on. This is the number of firms, and I, I don't have right time to go um, uh, into the reasons behind the strengths of this sector, but they include a portion of very highly educated uh, with adequate skills, people, strong academics and strong ties between the academia and the, uh, and the industry, uh, the effect of the army, of some parts of army service uh, with the skills it provides uh, and so on. Um, uh, and one uh, factor which actually uh, also uh, shows the strengths of the digital uh, activity in Israel is the uh, digitalization of the government sector, which is relatively high. It doesn't always feel that way uh, when we try to get some services through the uh, through the web, but relatively we're in good shape in this respect. A economic policy. Economic policy was quite supportive during uh, the pandemic. A large package, which included a, which included support for those who uh, lost their job. But when we look at the overall package, fiscal package, uh, in support of the economy, it was modest relative to uh, that in other uh, countries. Uh, and that's reflected in a relatively more modest increase in public debt relative to uh, other countries uh, or OECD countries on average uh, during the pandemic. Still, uh, currently, our debt to GDP ratio, or at the end of 2021, our debt to GDP ratio uh, was up from around 60 to close to 70% of GDP, close to the median of OECD countries. The safety net, which was deployed during the pandemic, was very affected and basically erased the decline of overall income. And the uh, and, uh, end result was that uh, disposable income for most groups actually went up during 2020. And so the, the safety net basically compensated almost fully for most groups for the decline in labor income. And that was very effective. Interest rates were very low, close to zero. Uh, that's something that uh, may change today, actually, with the interest rate decision that is going to take place today. Uh, the central bank was very active in, in uh, uh, deploying a set of unconventional measures to help businesses and households to deal with the uh, loss of uh, labor income. I won't go through all of that. It might come up with your questions. And when we look ahead, basically what we can see is a very strong recovery, inflation going up due to various reasons that if you are interested, I may go into later on. And uh, the current uh, projections by uh, the OECD are for a very strong recovery for the Israeli economy, uh, stronger than for most advanced economies. So uh, the, the world or the, the prospects for the Israeli economy are quite bright. However, we still have all the challenges that we have uh, had before. So I think for a brief introduction, uh, I'll stop here and I'll be happy to uh, take your questions. Thank you very much, Professor. I must say that we're, we're, uh, we're positively surprised by that, uh, by that prediction. Uh, you mentioned towards the very end the expected decision uh, today of the, the Bank of Israel to increase 
the rates after four years, sorry, the interest rates after four years. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit about that? Why and what does it mean for the economy? Yeah, sure. So this is sort of the current uh, uh, expectation by almost all analysts. And the reasons are actually quite clear. Uh, inflation has risen. Uh, it, uh, uh, the latest reading for the last 12 months was 3.5% uh, inflation, which is slightly over the upper bound of the target range, which is between one and 3%. It's much, much higher than it was before. It's much more modest than in, for example, the US that it's uh, around uh, 7% and the average for OECD countries, which is uh, close to 6%, but still it's a significant rise. Uh, but that's not the only reason. The, the, the other reason that, it ex that the bank is expected to raise interest rate is that also expectations for inflation over the medium term have risen uh, beyond the target. The economy is growing very fast. Labor market is becoming tight. Wages are going up. Uh, so it seems like the economy is getting hotter and uh, if uh, it, right now interest rate is very close to zero, so it's extremely expansionary and given inflation and the tight labor market and the high growth, uh, there, is, there are good reasons to start withdrawing the, the, the support by the monetary policy uh, for, for the economy and basically uh, in order to sort of make sure that, that inflation doesn't uh, accelerate. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how events in Europe are, are impacting things specifically here. Uh, do you know of any long-term plans Israel might have for the surge in oil prices, uh, whether it's through alternative supplies like the US has approved, or perhaps even a, an independent supply that we have here? Are there plans to utilize these? Okay, so uh, uh, first of all, the main uh, reflection of the current uh, uh, war uh, in Europe is in the growing prices of uh, uh, energy prices, uh, grains, metals, uh, which are all sort of uh, factors of production, which is a yet additional force that pushes uh, overall prices up. I think the uh, Israel in, is in a relatively uh, um, good position in the sense that uh, our growing reliance on the natural gas from our own reservoirs uh, reduces substantially the reliance on important energy. We still import a substantial amount, but it's much less than it would have been without the natural gas. Uh, and so the effect on, for example, electricity prices here is relatively modest. Uh, and uh, it's expected the use of natural gas will expand and it will uh, continue to replace some of the imported uh, energy. There is also a longer term plan to continue increasing the reliance on solar energy. Uh, here there are some, uh, still some technological uh, uh, barriers, uh, the fact that uh, we still don't have a strong te no technology to, um, uh, how do you say, to uh, collect uh, energy and use it later. Um, uh, but uh, here uh, we're talking about longer term plans and, and there is a lot of work on this technology globally as part of the intention to deal with, with uh, the warming and the need to reduce the reliance on, uh, on polluting energies. So I think in these respects, we are uh, uh, actually moving forward to more reliance or, on our own uh, energy sources. However, it's important to say that the tendency or the talk about being sort of self-sufficient, uh, I think 
uh, we should uh, be careful not going to the trend of sort of withdrawing from globalization. It started with the a pandemic where there was more talk about being self-sufficient. I think the strategy of self-sufficient self-sufficiency implies withdrawing from globalization and globalization has a lot of benefits basically utilizing the comparative advantages of countries so i think uh, there are some very key uh key supplies that you may want to make sure that you have you diversify your sources you 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 make sure that you're not reliant on only one source but trying to do it all yourself is a very dangerous path I think your answer brings us a perfect segue to the next question on uh, the issue of, uh, of Israel's ports. Uh, if we're talking about the need to be, to be global in our uh, importing and exporting, uh, the backlog of cargo, uh, which has costed the country an estimated $96 million per week, uh, was, was uh, quoted as undermining the national export reputation by uh, the head of the Manufacturers Association. Is this problem unique to Israel and what do you think the solution should be? So I, I'm not sure I, I have a good answer whether it's unique to Israel. I think the capacity of the ports potentially is sufficient. And the main issue here is uh, uh, getting uh, uh, a workable solution vis-a-vis -vis the uh, trade unions. And I hope that th this issue uh, will be resolved in a, I would say, in a permanent way. I think that here the strength and the ability of trade unions to uh, interfere with the uh, smooth and continuous operation of the ports is really a problem that needs to be addressed. Okay, uh, a simple and fair answer. Um, now, if we talk about the recent events over the last uh, few days, we've had a, a, a double issue, both uh, a coalition, uh, perhaps a coalition crisis in the making, as well as a wave of terror attacks. Could you talk about how each of these separate but also overlapping issues can impact Israel's economy, whether by uh, examples from the past or, or what we're likely to see now? Um, so regarding the terrorist acts, you know, unfortunately, Israel is um, uh, has ha has had a lot of experience with periods of uh, uh, security issues, and unless it develops into a very long uh, long term problem with uh, repeated. Uh, terrorist attacks on our cities. Uh, um, in, in terms of the effects on the economy, it's, it's normally quite modest. Again, the only period where I, that I can say that had a sustained, a very negative effect on the economy is going back to the period of the second intifada, where it was a prolonged, a, a period of uh, insecurity in all our cities and that actually had a, a, a negative effect on consumption and on overall activity. Shorter episodes uh, had a short-term effect uh, on the economy, obviously the effect on, on, on the quality of life and on life itself is, is, is terrible. Uh, but uh, I hope that it is uh, contained very quickly and, uh, and doesn't turn into a longer uh, period of, uh, of insecurity in our cities. Regarding the potential new cycle of uh, elections and, uh, and the political instability, I think here the uh, potential damage can be uh, substantial. Um, it's important to say that the, there was a large number of important reforms that have been decided upon as together with the, uh, with the um, last budget that was passed, but many of these reforms still need there are elements of those that need to be legislated uh, in order to actually be implemented. 
and uh, if uh, the government loses its ability to actually pass this legislation, uh, unfortunately, these important reforms will be will not be implemented. And I'm talking about the decision about the metro, which is a, a very important uh, infrastructure um, investment, uh, the reform in agriculture, which is supposed to be uh, uh, reducing the cost of living in particular of uh, fruits and vegetables and food in general, uh, and is supposed to actually uh, provide a sort of incentive for our agricultural sector to sort of move up technologically and become more competitive. Uh, the whole package which was agreed with the Eastern route, which has in, includes the minimum wage hike and other elements that are important for uh, making the labor market even more uh, flexible. This will also need to be legislated. And if uh, the government will not be able to push that through, this will also uh, not materialize. So I think in terms of, and I'm not, I'm talking about the reforms that have already been decided upon. Uh, obviously the, uh, the fact that if uh, the next budget is not passed, there will not be the set of reforms that are currently contemplated by the uh, government. So that will uh, be also quite unfortunate. And if we need, if we get back into this uh, mode of a continuous budget where you can only spend one twelfth of the previous year's budget, that's very restrictive for some of the activities uh, that are need to be financed by the budget, which is again a high price uh, for the economy at this stage. And the third price of instability is that uh, normally during periods of uh, political instability, the uh, policy, fiscal policy and government policy tends to be more short-sighted, short if not to say populist. And uh, I think the uh, fact, for example, uh, the, the um, intention of the Minister of Finance to condition the subsidization of early childcare on two parents working, which would push the Haredi men uh, uh, to the labor market, the fact that this is now put off because of political pressure is just one small indication that the ability to actually apply um, policies that are right for the longer term but are not very popular, at least by some, uh, by some uh, groups, uh, are very hard to implement during period of political instability. And just one uh, follow-up question, if that's okay. We did uh, promise our audience that we would finish within half an hour, so just one more. Uh, it's a follow-up question to a few things you were saying, actually. Um, do you see any correlation between the, the, the relatively new presence of Arab um, ministers, Arab members of government in the coalition, something that we didn't have in the past, uh, and uh, perhaps the employment rates of the Arab sector, whether this is a result of new new budgets, some sort of you know re refreshment of the market in that population. I I think there is a potential for that, but I think it's too soon to judge uh, the the program uh, that was uh, uh, as part of the budget, the decision which is called nine two three which is uh, the uh, provision of budgets for various programs, both on employment and on infrastructure and dealing with specific groups within the Arab sector are, support, are, are supporting uh, the employment of the growth in employment and the improvement in education for this sector, which is has the potential to support increase uh, of employment for uh, this population. And the question would be of implementation. I would say more generally that many of government uh, programs are very 
uh, positive and we sometimes encounter serious problems of implementation. And I think that if the uh, government will, uh, if, again, if we get into an election cycle, the uh, probability of uh, actually uh, implementing many of the programs uh, is going to be diminished. Right, so only time will tell. Uh, Professor Kelly Flug, Vice President of Research and William, and William Davidson, Senior Fellow for Economic Policy at the IDI, uh, and also former Governor of the Bank of Israel. Thank you again so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And thank you to my colleague, Ellie Klutstein, Press Coordinator at GPC for facilitating this interview, as well as JPC Director General Uri Dromi for his continued inspiration. Have a good day, everybody. We hope you enjoyed that briefing by the Jerusalem Press Club. If you did, like the video and hit the subscribe button to stay up to date with all of our future content.